Um, my name is Scott Beasley. I am the chair of the Nevada County Coalition of Firewise Communities. And we have a great uh, meeting for you tonight. So um, let's, uh, let, let's get into this and take a look at our agenda. So um, we are going to start with um, our usual reminders, uh, telling you about Code Red, the Nevada County dashboard, scout your route, and then find your five emergency allies. Um, and then a uh, monthly resource spotlight, um, including where to find previous meetings, and then before you walk out the door. Um, and then community partner reports. Um, I am going to just uh, throw, I get to throw out a couple of apologies, I, I guess. Um, I, I can tell you about half of our speakers are doing something today. So we're gonna see who joins us. Um, but there were four search and rescue call outs, um, a member of our uh, OES team, uh, Paul Cummings, who was actually leading one of those uh, searches today. Uh, so a little known fact, uh, after his 60 hours of day job, uh, keeping you safe, Paul then volunteers for search and rescue. And he replaced me uh, after I pulled an overnight. So if I look uh, and sound like a guy who hasn't slept in two days, it's because I am a guy who has not slept for two days. Other agenda items here, we, um, uh, after community partner reports, um, we will jump into our uh, monthly education spotlight. Um, and this month's spotlight is evacuation. So uh, coalition steering uh, committee member, Bob Long is gonna moderate that for us. Um, I'm gonna go over uh, some items about how to be ready to go that will serve as your transition into some evacuation specific things. We've got Lieutenant uh, Robert Jacobs talking about the high-low siren and code red dashboard. Uh, hopefully someone will be covering the dashboard today. Uh, then how to dress for evacuation. So instead of just you know wearing your PJs as you run out the door, Chris Riley is going to give you some great tips as to how to stay safe uh, er, in a fire. Chief uh, Gamble Guard with us today to talk about safe driving during an evacuation. Um, after that, uh, that is typically the bulk of our meeting. Uh, big part. Um, so who are we and what do we do? Again, I know we have a lot of uh, new faces here. So uh, Nevada County Coalition of Firewise Communities or the coalition, our mission is to promote fire safety through advocacy, education, and community involvement with other stakeholders interested in working hard, working towards stronger fire safety practices. And we got, a, again, a ton of stakeholders with you today. You know, we've got Grass Valley PD, we've got the Office of Emergency Services, we've got CAL FIRE, we've got Nevada County Consolidated, we have Nevada County Transportation Commission, all with data for you today. So um, a, a lot of good, a lot of good stuff going on here. So. Um, getting through these reminders, um, please, if you have not signed up for Code Red, please do that. Um, more information later, hopefully with uh, LT Jacobs. And then please bookmark the Ready Nevada County dashboard. Again, hopefully there's gonna be a little bit of a deep dive later on in our meeting about how to do that. And then scout your route. Do not wait till an evacuation occurs to figure out where you're going. Uh, some of you are really close to the freeway, that's great. Um, most of us live a little bit further out and it is time to explore and come up with not just one route, but as many routes as possible going in as many directions as you can to scout your route and figure out how to um, best evacuate when the time comes. Uh, and then find your five emergency allies. Um, so the idea here is um, having a, a bit of a buddy system and that, uh, that card that was on the last page, you can get this if you make your way to any OES event, um, including if you wanna hit up the Thursday night uh, downtown fair in Grass Valley, we're giving these away. So front page, you can find your five and share your plan. So that's the idea is you have five people, know which zone you're in, which evacuation zone they're in, how to reach each other, and you are able to take care of each other and not simply rely on the uh, county systems. So those are your, your reminders that we put out every month. And with that, Susan Rogers, I see you on the call, hand it off to you to talk about uh, resources of the month. Okay, thank you, Scott. The uh, 
in case you ever want to see anything on a previous meeting, you come to our website and you hit Zoom meeting archive. And this has all of the previous meetings on it. And this is where you can see the topics of that meeting. So if you're thinking, oh, gee, I want to see the one where they talked about such and such, you can look at the PDF of the agenda for that meeting and see what the topic was and find the one that you're looking for. The, uh, there are a couple of new things that we've done on here, and I'm just going to go over those real quick. Under rules and enforcement right here, the link for contacting the county to ask for a code, uh, what do you call it, a defensible space inspector to come out and look at somebody's property if your neighbor's not clearing their property and you want to file a complaint with the county to get somebody to come out, anonymous complaint, and admit that this is new at the top of the rules and enforcement page and will the link here right there will take you to the county website and this tells you how to get there once you get to that page so that is new another new thing on our website is this page right here other fire preparedness agencies and resources this used to be under our education resources page i moved it off to a new page and anything on prescribed burns is down here if you're looking for that and have a large parcel about subscribed burns. So our education resources page has been redesigned and revamped. And we took every, I took everything from last year's August 20th countywide educational event and uh, collated it all into here. And we have the best of the best at the top. And then underneath that, Everything is grouped by the type of category of the topic. Outside, all your defensible space stuff, landscaping, generator tips, and then there's your house, home hardening, all of that sort of thing. And then there's how to prepare and evacuating. This is our very important, everybody ought to have this. How to stay informed, all of the sources of what you, what do you listen to, what do you look at? How, if there's an actual fire, how do you get ongoing updated information? This is that document right here. What is the County of Nevada doing about wildfire preparedness? And they are doing a whole lot, as we know, the handbook, how to sign up for code red, how to know your evacuation zone, so that when they, if there's a big incident, they're going to be calling evacuation warnings and orders by the zone, not by just like south of Red Dog, north of 49 or whatever. It's going to be by zone number. You need to know your zone. Click here, follow the instructions. It's really easy and then a few other stuff. So that is all organized in a new way that'll help you help, hopefully help you find it more by the category of the topic. And we have one more new thing on here that I want to show you. It's the walking out the door checklist. These are new. We have it in two versions, uh, Chris Riley and the out okay subgroup of the evacuation committee of the coalition created a nice PDF a couple of years ago and, uh, and so we're trying to get that out there a little bit more. This one is ready to go. It's a PDF. It's like the last things to do before you walk out. But we've also adapted that into a Microsoft Word doc, right? This one, checklist of walking out the door in the Microsoft Word format. And if you have Word, you might prefer to get that one and then you can customize it, put things in or take them out uh, in a way that really works for you. So uh, this helps you Remember what to do before you, you know you got already got your go bag in the car, right? So this is this is the last minute stuff. So those are the new things on the website, and uh, we've just got lots of great stuff. This is one last thing I'll just mention here. I just saw this today. Um, these are the Cal Fire. Whoops, sorry, 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 forget that. This is from Marin County, and this is a nice little seven minute video from the guy who runs the Fire Safe Marin organization. They do a lot of great stuff over there. And it's an update on the zero to five zone, which they're calling ground zero, which is a good one because it's the zero zone, zone zero, instead of the, instead of zero to 30 feet, it's the zero to five feet as the research has shown is the most critical thing that you do around your house to keep your house from burning down. It's got little video snippets in it. It's got all kinds of visuals. It's great. And I doubt if anybody here has seen it, but I put it second on the best of best resources because it's so good, highly recommended. Back to you, Scott. Awesome stuff, Susan. Really, really appreciate it. You're getting some kudos in the comments as well. So um, I know you put a ton of time in revamping the site and making that more user friendly. So please, everyone, when uh, when you're you're done here tonight, spend some time checking that stuff out. 
Um, with that, we are going to, um, where we're at in the agenda, um, we are on to the community partner reports um, from Nevada County Consolidated Fire. Um, we have Deputy Fire Marshal Mason with us today. Hello and uh, good evening. Uh, keep it quick. I just want to touch a little bit on the uh, 4th of July weekend that we just had. Uh, I'm going to say it was very, very successful. Uh, we did not have any uh, fire started by fireworks that we responded to over the whole weekend. Um, we did participate with all the local law enforcement agencies in our uh, fireworks task force. So we were on Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. Um, got very few uh, fireworks complaint calls um, compared to what we usually get. So I think the word got out very well that there were no fireworks allowed in Nevada County. And uh, everyone kind of participated with the uh, local fireworks shoots that did go on the local displays that were pretty impressive, um, but overall very successful weekend. Good stuff. Thanks, Patrick. We know you were, we're probably working around the clock here these last few days. We, we do appreciate it for you and your crew. Um, I heard a rumor Paul Cummings made it back from the search. So from Nevada County Office of Emergency Services, do we have program manager Paul Cummings on? Um, the first thing I wanted to start off with was to highlight the exercise that we had on the 9th of June with the Lake Wildwood folks. This was a really great opportunity for us to all come together and uh, practice our wildfire evacuation exercises or our uh, skills. So this was a wildfire focused uh, exercise on the 9th of June with uh, Nevada County Sheriff's Office, our search and rescue evacuation team. We had CAL FIRE, PG&E, Penn Valley Fire, Lake Wildwood staff, county staff, Cal OES. It was really a comprehensive opportunity uh, for everybody to come together and practice a skill set that we hope to not have to use this summer. Um, I'd like to leave our, our folks on the call though with the, um, uh, with the impression that we did pretty well. We, we, it was a great learning opportunity. There's all, always um, things that we can get better at, but uh, I, it left me with the impression that we're certainly ready uh, for wildfire season. We did code red. The Lake Wildwood population and that was a good opportunity to test that system and let the folks there make sure that they were signed up uh, for Code Red as well. So uh, that went really well. We'll be doing something like that again likely next year, but right now we're going to uh, just make sure we're focused on the rest of the wildfire season. Speed of it. Lastly, I think Scott already mentioned it, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of outreach right now. We're really trying to focus on getting people signed up for Code Red, making sure people know their zone, making sure people stay ready, uh, that they're staying tuned in to those trusted news sources and um, they're ready for that fire weather and for those tough fire weather days. I really appreciate it. You have a lot going on out there in the community and appreciate you getting the word out there. Um, fire Safe Council of Nevada County, who, uh, who we got today? I'd like to take it, Scott. Thank you very much. This is Pat Leach, your FireWise coordinator with the Fire Safe Council and a couple of updates from our program uh, supervisors. Let's see, for those of you that are interested, quoted work, that's the um, paid work that the uh, gentlemen are doing is currently four to six weeks out if you were to place an order now. Chipping is four to five weeks out for members and eight weeks for non-members. Um, it appears as though we're going to have to start uh, charging more money for weed eating because we need a fire watch person involved with that uh, particular type of work. Let's see, as uh, don't forget the fair is coming up the first week in August and we will be manning a booth there if anybody would care to join us. And the red zone affair, it's my understanding that uh, the one that was canceled was sold out. We do not know, uh, I, I do not have any facts on whether there will be more tickets available, I believe the the team that's working on that is uh, sorting all of that out right now and reaching out to all of the people that had purchased tickets in the past. Um, we would like some volunteers for that as well. There'll be 
two different events, one a, a lunch and one a dinner. And your meal is included as a volunteer. And then, um, let's see. I'd like to mention that Lake Wildwood has uh, was successfully separated into two Firewise communities last month. Actually, it's been a couple of months. And we are working with Alta Sierra right now. So anybody in Alta Sierra that would like to be a resident leader, please reach out to me. Very much like to work with you. And then Banner Mountain will be next. And this is coming from NFPA. They are finding that areas that are too large just aren't functioning quite as well as they'd like to see. Although I have to admit, Nevada County Firewise communities are doing a fabulous job, a really wonderful job. We only wish that we had more crews to help you all too, but they're working on that at the office. So right now we have 60 Firewise communities. The latest one is 2,700 acres off of um, Edwards Crossing called the Lake City Grizzly Hill. There are four currently being reviewed by Cal Fire. That's French Corral, 3,000 acres. Ponderosa on the ridge. French Corral is on the ridge. Martis Peak up in Eastern uh, Nevada County and Kentucky Flat. They are all being reviewed right now. And the ones that I mentioned next, I hope that if we haven't already been in touch, that you would try to reach out to me because I may not have your correct information. It's Cruise on Grade, Old Mill, Osborne Hill, Robinson Byron Brem, Toll Mountain, Wampum Level, Wildwood Heights. And in eastern Nevada County, Floriston, Flavada Woodlands, Sierra Meadows, and the Boulders. So those are the ones that are very active right now. But we still have another 25, which brings our total to 100 Firewise communities in Nevada County. Wow. Thank you all very much for all that you're doing, the coalition for doing an awesome job on their website. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Scott, for keeping us uh, moving along. It's a great partnership. And I do hope that um, you'll be in touch with me if I don't reach out to you first. Please go ahead. Email is the best way because I'm all over the place and um, those I seem to get. The phone calls, it's really hard. Okay. That's what we have for now. Thanks so much, Pat. And if I could uh, direct your attention to the chat, a couple people asked your contact info, which is in there, but there's a couple, or at least one person looking for details on that, that Lake Wildwood split. So um, good stuff though. Yeah, the, we, are, we are recognized as a county in many ways. And anytime that a uh, county of our size gets put in the, the same listing as counties with funding and demographics like Marin, uh, that's pretty fantastic, pretty remarkable. So kudos to all of you uh, on this call for, for taking steps to, to better yourselves and, and the community around you. Um, our last partner report, um, Nevada, Nevada County Transportation Commission. Uh, do, uh, your contact is Nevada County Transportation Commission is not the county, um, different, different group. And they are seeking input from the public on what are some of the gaps in the transportation network in Nevada County related to weather driven events and climate change. So absolutely wildfire, which is your context for this meeting, of course. But in addition to that, um, think about snowfall. Those of you that are uh, up the hill, maybe uh, above 4,000 feet. Think about heavy rains and some of the flooding that we've experienced in downtown Nevada City proper. Um, think about all the ways that you would love to use as evacuation routes, but you don't have a $90,000 rock crawler with 36 inch mud tires. Um, any, um, any feedback uh, I've been told is welcome as long as it's practical. So um, 
they are reaching out to us um, asking for our opinion. So it's an interactive map. Click a button, drop a pin where you want it on the map um, related to cycling, driving, um, any other mode of transport and, and put your feedback down there. So this is a fantastic opportunity for us. Um, thanks to Jeff Peach um, at the coalition here, our, uh, our, our, our tech guru, he just threw that link down. So even if you don't have time to do it now, please copy and paste that and maybe a separate browser window and um, come back to that at uh, another time so you can, you can fill that out. So I know they'd appreciate it. Um, all right, so those are our partner reports and um, I'm going to kick it over to um, steering committee member, Bob Long, to talk about evacuations as our monthly education spotlight. Bob, show's yours. Okay, thank you, Scott. So for the past three months, we have been talking about ready and set. We've reminded you how to harden your home, how to do landscaping. We've educated you on go bags and, uh, and f find your five, how to, how to work with your neighbor to, uh, to uh, get everything ready. Uh, tonight, we hit that part that we hope we never have to do. And it's the go part of the ready, set, go. It's something we, uh, uh, many of us have never experienced, but some of us had, have, and it's, an, it, you just don't want to go there. So tonight, we're, that is what we're going to talk about the, uh, when we get that phone call and it's time to evacuate. So Scott's going to talk to us for a few minutes about insurance and your go bag and storing information. Um, so... For those of you who didn't know the story of, of how I, I got here um, and, and somehow just sucked into this disaster management world, um, I was part of the, um, the blackout in the Northeast that knocked out power from New York through Pennsylvania, part of Canada and Southeast Michigan, then moved in Florida to Florida in time for hurricane season um, and had to evacuate my one room studio apartment with the picture window facing east to the coast um moved to minneapolis in time for my 31st floor office looking down on the mississippi river to see the bridge collapse um best vacation ever going to greece just in time for the tear gas canisters to start flying uh, in syntagma square uh, before escaping to saloniki before the m5 rifles came out and running uh, to kosovo um, and then my experience with search and rescue and wildfire here um, and, and I can tell you, I have one strategy for all of those. So whether it's long guns, um, uh, hurricanes, wildfire, et cetera, it, it is to go. Um, and that's what we're talking about here tonight. Um, but to go, you have to be ready to go. So my talk tonight is kind of serving as that transition. Um, the first thing is that you need to be physically ready to go financially ready to go and then be ready not on paper. Um, but to start um, physically, I don't think this deserves much attention. We've spoke ad nauseum about go bags. All I'm gonna say is if you've got the go bag, take one extra step, make it your already gone bag, put it in your car. So you don't even have to think about it, right? The glasses, the extra clothing, the meds, et cetera. Um, if it can be in your car, put it there. And then the one thing not referenced in the material Susan put out earlier is have a plan for your puppy. So make sure that you don't are tempted to go back home to go be a hero and save your dog. Make sure you have um, a neighbor or 10 who have already got that dog for you. That's my guy right there. Um, and then be ready financially. You don't want to have any thoughts about trying to do what Patrick Mason and his team of experts do. You do not want to be the person out there with a three eighth inch garden hose trying to save your house. Um, be comfortable knowing that it is protected. So save your life, not your stuff. Um, the right hand of your screen here, and sorry if this is small text, but your top right arrow is pointing to the top line of your homeowner's insurance policy. Pretty much every company lays it out like this. This is a random example I pulled from the internet. Um, top line, coverage A dwelling. That is your house. It is not your stuff. It is not the outbuildings. It is your home proper. In Nevada County, I have yet, I'm not talking to many contractors that are build, rebuilding houses for anything short of 300 bucks a square foot. So do the math, look at that top line, coverage A dwelling, 
and make sure that you are, um, you know, taking care of, uh, you know, enough of that property um, that you could rebuild if that's what you want to do. Coverage B other structures is the number they throw in typically is just 10% of the top line. So if you have 290,000, there's 29,000 here. If you have a million up top, you have 100,000 here. In Nevada County, where we all have the detached garage, the chicken coop, the pool shed, the yurt, the second garage, the wood shop, et cetera, you might not have enough coverage there. You need to take a look to make sure you have enough to rebuild all those detached other structures. Coverage C personal property, again, is typically a percentage. They're usually gonna throw in 60 to 70% of this top line. Um, so most of you have enough coverage by dollar amount. The question is, can you prove what you have? Um, you don't need, like this is, remember, you're not staging your home for sale. So if you spend more than 90 minutes on this project, you either live in a 10,000 square foot mansion or you're having too much fun. So just take a quick walk around your house and grab a panoramic of every room. If there's something unique in that room, so not your Fruit of the Loom boxers, gentlemen, I'm, I'm, I'm talking something unique. Um, I don't know anything about your homes, but in my house, I'm a bit of a snob in the kitchen. I don't just have knives. I have Henkel Pro Series S knives with a picture close enough that you can read Pro Series S on every one of those knives. I also have some of the oldest, just nastiest Ikea dishes and silverware. I don't have a separate picture of those because when I go to the adjuster and say, I need 20 bucks to replace all my plates, they're going to believe me. But if you have local pottery, I would absolutely have a picture at the bottom of those plates stamped with that artist. Um, bicycles, I have a ton of bicycles. And when a bicycle was stolen from a garage where I used to live, um, I had a picture zoomed into the drivetrain so that when they came back and told me that they found a Fuji bike at Walmart for $280, I said, try again with the exact model. They said, wow, you have a $2,000 bicycle? I said, no, try again, zoom in on the components. I eventually got my $5,000 check for the bike that uh, you know I, I raced with. So again, whatever it is in your world, chainsaws, fishing gear, et cetera, just take some pictures, lots of pictures. And then um, just know that if you look at the bottom half of the screen here, know that there's limits to those uh, things categorically. So like um, talking to you here in Nevada County, there are limits for firearms. So just because you might have half a million dollars of coverage for your personal property, there's categorical limits for things like jewelry, firearms, electronics. Don't pay much attention to the specifics here. It varies company to company. So you need to call your agent and ask what your categorical limits are if you happen to have art or stemware or unique things like that. Um, unlike everything else I share with you, this is one of the few things I'm qualified to talk about for my day job uh, as a financial advisor. So don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions. And then your third thing, be ready on paper or more accurately be ready not on paper so have your important documents and pictures saved to the cloud all right i know like we, we you, you started with a a spare bedroom filled with stuff you consolidated that to the box but it's time to take the box and save it electronically all right so there's two ways you can scan your papers one, walk in the front door at Staples. They will do everything that does not include a social security number, so not your taxes, but more or less everything else Staples will do for you, put it on a thumb drive for you. And, and maybe that's it for you. Maybe you put it on the thumb drive. Uh, one thumb drive sits in your glove box. The other one gets shipped off to your, your kids down the hill uh, in a safe location, and that's it. But if you want to put it on the cloud, you're going to need some way to scan things locally. So your other way here, I use this cam scanner app. And I will tell you until two months ago, I was absolutely completely happy with it. Uh, it now contains a ton of pop-up ads, but cam scanner, if you go to the app store on your phone or Google play, um, that's what an, another option from cam scanner, you pull up the app, click the little picture button down below, then pulls up a document. So I just put my back, my, my COVID shot. I wanted to save electronically. You can see there, I didn't, take a picture of it properly. It's not framed, it's nothing. Cam scanner automatically frames it for me and makes it upright so that it's framed properly that then you can immediately upload it to whatever place you wanna store it at. So um, again, it, it, it is that simple um, in terms of using that app. Once you've uploaded it, then you need to, or once you've uh, taken a picture of it, 
you then need to open a cloud storage account to put it somewhere. So Google Drive, Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Cloud, you know, whatever you want. There, there are plenty of options. I'm going to show you Dropbox. It is literally as easy as going to dropbox.com, entering your email address. I might suggest using your off email address. So please, no one actually email me at this email address. Uh, it's not a thing I use. And I would suggest you use your other email address, whatever that is. Um, then takes you to your options of which of these two expensive products do you want, or down below, continue with two gig basic plan for free. From there, um, you can see I have categories for a lot of different things in my life, but to create a new folder, if you've ever used a Windows-based system, that's how this works. So create a new folder. I have one that's titled Financial Tax and Estate. All right, I've got just a bunch of things I dump in here at random as I get my monthly and quarterly statements. I have shared it here, bottom right, with my wife, so we can both look at what those items are. Um, uh, if I wasn't so young and in denial about my mortality, I would probably share that with, you know, my friends who will be serving as my successor trustee, people who will make decisions when I am dead. Um, and then the third thing here, remember those pictures I, we, we took several slides ago of all that personal property that you guys are going to do after this call tonight? You're going to walk around and take those pictures. You're then going to put those up on the cloud. Um, had a client take my advice, take the pictures, put on her laptop. What do you think the first thing that thieves stole when they broke into her home? Those pictures. So that's it, um, putting it together. Um, I went really quick. So if that was really confusing, step three, just find a younger person to explain everything that I just went on too fast. Like they'll, you know, they'll walk you through it. But it, 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 I, I think you're gonna find it, it, it is not that challenging. You're, you're going to figure it out. Um, the thing is just do it. I know I'm not the first person to tell you this. So if it's not tonight after the meeting, do it tomorrow. But remember, you are not staging your home for sale to take those pictures. Um, you, you don't need tax returns back to the 1980s. Just get the most important stuff, get the pictures of it, get it uploaded to the cloud, all right? If you got questions, hit me up. Um, I see there's a bunch of uh, questions in the comment. I will um, I will uh, try to address these real quick like, um, uh, many of you cannot get all the insurance, only the fair plan, which has basic fire. So that is correct. So fair plan is fire and fire only. It does coverage A, B, and C. So that's like tangible things. You then go to your other carrier, State Farm, Allstate, Geico, whatever. And, and they will cover those things plus liability for everything that does not involve fire and explosion. All right. Um, for a price. Um, ah, Chief Gamelgaard, thank you. So um, fair plan is broken out quite similar to how I just uh, described it, um, but it does not cover liability. That is accurate. You need a separate policy to cover you in case you get you get sued. Um, and then instead of cam scanner, yeah, there's plenty of other things out there. Adobe Scan, um, we got a we got a shameless plug for that, which is awesome. Um, to hear someone else has something else they're happy with. I also went and bought an eighty dollar HP printer from. Um, uh staples or whatever that office store is in um uh the brunswick basin and it actually came with an app from hp and the hp app is pretty phenomenal like i, I the printer sucks but I, I think the app is worth the 80 bucks i spent on the printer so plenty of options out there um i will go throw my contact info in the comments and back to you bob okay thank, thank you very much Thanks, Scott. So now that we're in a position where we're comfortable and we know our documents are safe and that's put to the back of our mind, uh, now comes the warning. It's it's time to leave. And so Lieutenant Lieutenant Jacobs is going to uh, tell us about the, the warning systems that Nevada County has in place. So Lieutenant Jacobs, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Bob, can you hear me okay? We can. Thank you. Right. Yeah, we're going to leave our camera off just because Paul and I don't have great bandwidth where we're at. Uh, okay. But yeah, we've uh, we've decided Paul and I are going to split this presentation up. So originally I was going to do uh, code red and high low siren. And he was going to do the dashboard. I'm actually going to do high low siren and the dashboard. And then Paul's going to finish us off with code red and other types of alerting systems. So if I may, I'm going to try to share my screen here real quick. 
As soon as you see it, let me know so that I know everybody can see it because I'm working off a laptop. We got it. We can see it. Okay, great. Perfect. Yeah. So obviously we're talking about tools uh, for folks to be ready to go. Uh, what I would say is that one of the best tools that we have out there is OES's flagship website, which is readynevadacounty.org. Uh, if you can't see the URL up there on the top bar because my, my screen is blocking it, it's again readynevadacounty.org. There's tons of information on there. That's really where we promote the Ready, Set, Go campaign. Uh, and under the Go tab is where you're gonna find all the information that we're talking about here tonight. Uh, we had already mentioned evacuation zones. We've talked about the Ready Nevada County dashboard, uh, evacuation tags, we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, high low siren, which I'm gonna get into now. Uh, so I'm already on the Go tab. So if I scroll down here, uh, we actually have a wonderful short video that uh, was put together a couple of years ago now. It's got our law enforcement leaders of the community, my sheriff, Shannon Moon. I know Alex Gamelgard, who's on here. He's also featured in this video. Uh, really what this video does is it, it tells everybody why it's important to understand the high-low and what the call to action is. If you hear this sound, it means only one thing, evacuate immediately. You will only hear this sound during an evacuation order. If time permits, officers and deputies will be responding to your area and using PAs and going door to door to do evacuations. But if you hear this sound, you can help them in doing their job safely and evacuate the area immediately. Your job, know the sound and know what it means. Evacuate. 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 The reason it's important is because if you guys are woken up, in, you know, in the middle of the night and you hear this very distinctive siren uh, coming from any one of our law enforcement police vehicles driving through your neighborhood, we want you to understand what it is. We don't want you to have to try to figure it out uh, in the moment. So we, we really wanna drive folks to this website so that they can watch this video. Uh, in this video, you're gonna hear not only those reasons why it's important, but you're gonna hear each one of these law enforcement leaders tell you that when you hear the high low siren, it means only one thing. It means it's time to go. It's not time to contemplate. It's not time to start making phone calls to try to figure out what's going on. Understand that your life is in serious jeopardy. It's time to go. It's time to put that evacuation plan into place and execute that plan. Grab your go bag if it's in the vehicle or like Scott talked about, have it in the vehicle already. It's time to leave. Uh, put into place that evacuation plan and follow, those, follow one of those evacuation routes that you should have pre-scouted. Uh, the jump over to the Ready Nevada County dashboard, uh, as Scott talked about, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive. I know I'm limited on some time, so I'm going to really try to hit the highlights of what's going on with our Ready Nevada County dashboard. Uh, for those of you that uh, were familiar with this tool last summer during the Jones fire, uh, we found that it was a very popular tool with the public, a lot of great information to be had here uh, during an incident, but there's also plenty of information that you can get from this site before an incident as well. Uh, the very first tab that's always going to appear by default anytime you visit this dashboard is what we refer to as the wildfire and evacuation incident dashboard. So really it's a dashboard within a dashboard. It's the very first tab on the left. Uh, this tab is where we have our evacuation map centered directly in the middle. This is probably the biggest change. So we did kind of a facelift of our dashboard over the last couple of months. And this was probably the most noticeable change was on this tab. Uh, what we've done is we've now embedded the Zone Haven site where we're promoting the Know Your Zone, the zone-based evacuation concept. Uh, we've actually embedded Zone Haven's map directly in the middle of the dashboard here so that if we start to issue evacuation orders and we start to uh, notify residents via Code Red and other, other media outlets that we're conducting evacuations, we're also going to be changing the status of these zones right here in Zone Haven. And so folks can now see those adjustments made in real time right here on the dashboard. Uh, some of the things that we've kept that we felt were, were important are the metrics for the fire. So once OES becomes aware of some of these data metrics relating to the fire, as far as the size of the fire, how many acres it is, uh, any known containment uh, percentages, how many personnel have been assigned to the fire or any structural damage that we're aware of. We're gonna put that information on that left-hand side for folks to see. And then, of course, we've, we've still got the widget on the right-hand side where we've got OES's Twitter page that's displaying on here 24 hours a day. Uh, so 
this, like I said, this tool isn't always to be used during an incident, but you can come here anytime and you can see the OES Twitter feed where uh, we, share, we share a lot of tweets from uh, other allied agencies, uh, such as our news agencies and CAL FIRE. All you have to do is just scroll down and you can see some of the most recent tweets uh, that have been sent out and shared by us. Uh, but if you click the arrow to the right on the, the widget, it'll take you from our Twitter feed to our Code Red Alerts widget. This can be important for a couple of reasons. If somebody hasn't gotten signed up for Code Red, obviously they didn't get the message, they can come here and they can see those Code Red messages that have gone out. Uh, this widget is designed to display the last five Code Red messages that have gone out. Uh, on here, you can see that we've got three emergency alerts and then two general alerts. One of those was the, the test Code Red message that we sent out to our communities in Lake Wildwood during the Lake Wildwood exercise. The beauty of this widget is that we give you the ability to listen to that same message that was sent out. So if for some reason you missed it or you got it, but you couldn't understand it or it, it talked too quickly on the voice, you can always come here and you can re-listen to that message as many times as you need. You can also see the emails that were sent out to the, to the Code Red subscribers. And you can even click the see affected area and it'll show you a map of the area that we actually sent that Code Red out to uh, for the community. And then if you click over one more time from there, we actually have the Nixel widget uh, embedded here as well. So for those of you who live on the east side of the county and you follow uh, the Truckee Police Department's uh, page there for uh, Nixel, we actually have their widget installed there as well. So you can go there and you can see the information that they're pushing out there as well. Uh, continuing on on the dashboard, the next tab over is burn day status. I'm going to jump past that one. I think we should all know that we're, uh, we're in a no burn day status right now, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. I want to jump over to the third tab over, which is live fire webcams. Uh, this, is a, this is another new addition to our dashboard, or I should say we gave it a facelift recently. Uh, we used to pull our, our, our thread, our data thread, uh, directly from uh, Cal OES. And unfortunately, we ran into a problem with that data feed uh, not long ago, so we were unable to continue to push that thread. And so we got some complaints from the community talking about how that was a great site and folks had wished that we had brought it back. So our GIS folks actually found uh, Wi-Fi, which is its own website, and we just directly embedded the Wi-Fi website right here into the dashboard. Uh, I will admit I'm not an expert with this site, but for the amount of time I have played with it, I found it to be extremely useful. Uh, one thing I will point out is on the upper right hand side here, uh, there is a layers box. If you hover over that, it gives you a whole bunch of other options where then you can expand and you can follow certain things such as weather watches and warnings. So you can see here that I have that selected. And so my, my view is that I can see any of these weather warnings that are coming up. So whether they're excessive heat watches, heat warnings, a fire weather watch, or even a red flag warning, uh, the benefit to keeping that layer on is it's going to show you the geographic coverage for which that uh, weather warning or the red flag warning has been issued. Uh, the cameras, you can, you can select the alert wildfire pan tilt zoom cameras. Again, I already have that selected. So you can see the location of each one of those cameras. So all you have to do is just hover over that, double click on a camera, and it's going to give you the option to put that into a full screen view. Uh, you, can all, you also have options to uh, look at different types of fuels. Uh, you can pull up historical fires, active fire perimeters. You can choose to look at different satellite imagery as well if you'd like. So we've gotten some really good feedback since we put this up. Uh, again, I'm not an expert on it, so I, I'm not going to run you through every little gadget and, and widget on here. I encourage folks to come to the site, spend some time uh, playing with it and learning about all the different information that you can get from that. Of course, we still have our current weather on here, which is going to show you uh, wind speed and direction. It's going to give you things like relative humidity and temperature. Uh, it's the same tab that we've had up running. So again, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, you can see it, it takes a bit to load that. Uh, I want to jump over to our roadside vegetation management tracker tab real quick. Uh, this is the latest tab that we put up. This actually just went live in the last couple of weeks. Uh, for folks who are curious about vegetation management projects that are occurring throughout the county, uh, this is a great resource. Uh, this is actually going to show you vegetation management projects that we have scheduled in the county uh, for the next five years. So from 2021 through 2025, we have every single scheduled uh, vegetation management project 
for the roadsides listed on here. And so you can follow that. You can see how many miles we've accomplished to date, how many miles we have left to go in this current year or in those, those following years. Uh, you can see that information on the left-hand side here in our bar charts. Uh, we have this cool little speedometer <laughs> metric here showing just how much we've, we've actually accomplished in this year. And then of course, you've got the main map. You can blow that main map up and you can zoom in on it to see your neighborhood. So if you wanna find your neighborhood, you can do that. You can also use the search feature if you wanna actually search out an address. It'll take you down to your, your residence real quick. And then you can select these roads to get more information about the vegetation management work that's gonna occur on those roads. So for instance, here I clicked on Idaho, Maryland, and it's talking about a section of work that's, that's to be completed in uh, 2021 for that section of road. So tons of great information uh, to be had here if, if you want to know about these different vegetation projects that are going to be occurring either in your neighborhood or, or neighborhoods close to you. And then the final tab here, uh, it's one that's near and dear to my heart. It's the evacuation route pre-planner tab. Uh, if you've visited this tab in the last couple of weeks, you may have experienced an error with the page loading. Uh, we've corrected that error. We just got that fixed last week. So thank you to the, the folks who sent in a couple of emails letting us know about that problem. Uh, this really is a critical page. This is where we want you to come uh, and scout your route. This is where we want you to find those, those three ways out of your neighborhood, uh, have, have alternatives, have options. And then of course, once you find those directions, we give you the ability to print here. Uh, we, we found last year uh, an increasing number of folks growing frustrated with the fact that they can't actually buy printed maps. It's very difficult to find printed maps uh, that are being produced these days commercially. Uh, so we give you the ability to print. So we highly encourage that you visit this site, come to this tab, find those three ways out if you have three ways out and then print those off and maybe put those in your glove box or put those in your go bag so that you have them when you need them. So again, that's uh, readynevadacounty.org. We'll take you to our main OES website where we've got tons of information about Ready, Set, Go. And then the Ready Nevada County dashboard is here with all kinds of new enhanced features. And I'm gonna turn it over to Paul Cummings now, who's going to talk to you about Code Red and other ways to stay informed. Yeah, good evening folks. Paul Cummings from County OES again. Uh, really excited about that new vegetation tracker, uh, like Lieutenant Jacobs already mentioned. I do want to point out that that is a county road only tracker. So private roads will not be depicted there. That's only county roads. But you should be encouraged. Our, our county public works folks are getting a lot done. Uh, they've got some grant dollars that they're using to supplement their existing funding. So they're really trying to um, get through those roads as fast as they can. So I'm just going to talk really quickly about Code Red and, and a couple of the other systems that are out there to keep you informed during a wildfire. Um, I think we did a pretty deep dive the last meeting into Code Red and, and the integ integrated public alert and warning system. So this will just be a bit of a refresher. So I think, you know, I know that um, the coalition's rem uh, reminding all of you at the beginning of all their meetings to sign up for Code Red. Uh, so you can do that at readynevadacounty.org, uh, like Lieutenant Jacobs already mentioned, or um, via 211. Folks can call 211 to get signed up. Uh, just a reminder, this is an opt-in system. So the people that are um, enrolled in Code Red have to actually sign up. So, you know, we, we really want to encourage the public to take responsibility for the accuracy of their data, uh, the, their uh, website addresses, their emails, their um, phone numbers, landlines, cell phones, things like that. Just make sure that that's current. You can have a managed account. That's the best way to go. To, to be able to see that and have control over that. Ask your friends, your family, your coworkers, if they're signed up for Code Red, this is the time to make sure that everybody in the county is ready to get that message. That'll come from the County Sheriff's Office, uh, from Grass Valley PD, Nevada City PD, and from OES. Um, so Code Red is one of the many safety nets that we use along with um, getting it, staying informed, you know, whether it's via the radio, internet news, Hilo siren, like Lieutenant Jacobs mentioned. Again, I won't go into details, um, I think that a lot of you have already seen the list of resources to stay informed uh, during a wildfire. Um, I do want to point out that, you know, this is one of the many safety nets that we have. Code Red, we do our best to have an accurate system and, and to, to maximize that system during an evacuation and a, and a wildfire um, notification. Um, but it's not perfect, and that's why it's important that you have other ways of staying informed. 
Um, I want to touch on a, a question that we get a lot and that we've gotten a lot recently, and that is, when will I get a code red or why didn't I get a code red? Um, and, and please uh, understand this and, and ask questions and, and get this message out to your friends and family again. Um, we're only going to send a code red when there's a call to action. So when, you're, when your zone that you are in is under an evacuation warning or order, under those two circumstances, we will send out a code red. Yeah, so uh, if there's an evacuation warning or order, so the warning is get ready to go. And if you're somebody who needs a little extra time to evacuate or you have livestock or horses, things like that, that you're loading up, that's the time that you really should be going. And then if you're under an order, uh, you know, that's an order, you, you must go. You, you, your life is in extreme danger and they wouldn't be sending you that order uh, message through Code Red or other means if, if your um, home and your property and your family were not under extreme peril. So please um, evacuate immediately. That's why we're really encouraging that readiness that you get the message, you have your go bag packed, your family's ready, you have a plan, and it shouldn't take you very long to get everything together and to get out. We do have a couple of other tools that we use as part of the integrated public alert and warning system, the um, EAS, which stands for the emergency alerting system. So this is a federal FEMA system that um, we don't use very often because it has a, it, it does cast a wide net with that message, but um, that's gonna be uh, a recorded message that we'll create. It's in English and in Spanish that will be very similar, if not exactly the same as the warning and order message that's gone out uh, via Code Red. And we'll put that out over the radio. So it'll interrupt broadcasts on KNCO, KVMR broad, uh, partners uh, broadcasting stations. It'll also create scrolling text along the bottom of the screen on your TV, depending on the channel, that will have that same text-based information about the location of the fire, which zones have been uh, issued a warning or an order, where shelters are located. I do see the chat kind of going and I haven't fully read them, but there's questions about shelters. We really try to figure out if we're gonna evacuate people, um, where those shelters are gonna be so that when we start sending code red messages out, we can uh, make sure to get that information into the code red. Um, so sorry, I think I was talking about when will I get a code red. So evacuation warning and order, call to action. But I also wanna point out that it does take a little bit of time for that situation to develop. So I know that there's been some fires that have happened in the county over the last month, you know, like the Hutto fire or the McCourtney fire, where there were very localized evacuations with the high-low siren at a street level. That might have only been a few houses because they were immediately threatened by an adjacent fire. But we didn't see anything on the dashboard and we didn't see anything go out via Code Red. Uh, in, in all of those situations, it's not that that tool, they didn't want to use it. It just wasn't appropriate at the time. And to send out a mass notification like that, we really have to have some pretty good situational awareness and I guess information about what that fire is gonna do and who it's gonna affect. So what they'll do is they'll do those localized evacuations with the high-low and as we're building that situational awareness and starting to get that message out to people that can actually you know, send that code red in the field or in the EOC for instance, um, then they'll send that out. So, so you may not get the code red because it really didn't cross the threshold to send a code red. And so I hope that answers that question. Um, and if it's an ongoing developing situation, you can certainly expect those. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be signed up and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't um, continue to check the dashboard if you have questions. Paul, we have a question about whether you're going to do another code red test countywide this year. Is that still, still scheduled for August? That's a great question, Susan. Yes, August 16th, I believe is the date we're shooting for. And so um, we'll get more messaging out around that as we start to do the planning because you know, we have to do a lot of planning on our end and we want to really do messaging around that to encourage signups and to make sure it goes smoothly because it's we also have to manage expectations with the public because we've learned that if you're going to send a code red message to 35,000 households um, it takes a while it can take hours actually for that message to propagate because um, it has to take time to work through the whole cellular and landline network but that's a great question yes there will be another test this summer um, the last thing i'll talk about was the wireless emergency alert this is something else that we can use through the integrated public alert and warning system. Uh, it's very targeted to um, cell phones that are in a particular area. Um, it also depends on the accuracy and the age of the phone as to whether they will receive the message. But it's, a, it's essentially a text-based message, message that we can send very similar to an Amber, Amber Alert with the information about the wildfire evacuation uh, warning or order, zone information. We can even put a link to the dashboard in that um, WIA alert. And I also want to mention we will try to put links to the Zone Haven website or our dashboard in the code red messages that we send. 
that way you can click the link when you get it in your text message and it'll take you right to the to, to either of those websites depending on the situation and you can see which zones have been activated so um, watch for that when you get your text message so lastly i think i've already said this but you know these are all great tools um, but they are limited uh, they're not perfect and and we want them all to work and we hope that every one of them works and that you get re you know repeated messages that, you, that you're hearing it on the radio you're seeing it on Ubinet that you got a code red and you saw it, um, you know you got a wee alert but these things can be limited by uh, landline and cell phone saturation so if everybody's on the phone talking about the event that's going on that message may not get through power outages that can be caused by wildfires or um, by public safety power shot off can limit the propagation of these messages. And then just wildfire in general um, can destroy infrastructure, which could make getting this message out um, even harder. So this is where I think we need to have lots of different ways to stay informed, like we've talked about. Um, find as many ways as you can to get, to get informed of the message. Don't wait for a code red. I wanna repeat that, don't wait for a code red message. Don't wait for somebody from a, a position of authority, whether it be the sheriff's office or for the county to tell you to leave. If you feel threatened, if you smell smoke, if you're hearing sirens, if you hear about a fire near you, just go. Grab your family, grab your things, get out and, and execute your evacuation plan. That's all I've got, Susan, and I can take questions. Uh, Paul, we have two questions of people specifically who were looking at the dashboard while you and uh, Bob were speaking. And they've got, for some reason, they are having uh, issues like uh, Ann says she only sees large banners and, and another woman says something about uh, when she looks at the incident bash dashboard, the code reds are, are noted invalid date. I don't expect you to be able to solve that on this on this call since uh, you can't see what they're seeing. But who could who could these uh, participants contact to ask these kinds of questions specifically about issues that they're seeing when they look at the dashboard? Yeah, thanks, Susan. That's Bob Jacobs again. Yeah, that's a great question, and yeah, we found that there is definitely variety as far as folks and what they could see on the dashboard. It's technology and definitely dependent, depending on what system you're on. Uh, we found that uh, the browser Chrome is the best browser. You get the best viewing experience. So we would encourage folks to use Chrome. Uh, we understand that not everybody wants to use Chrome or not everybody has Chrome, uh, but that, that we have found to be the best. Uh, if people are having technical issues with the dashboard, the best way that they can report that issue to us so that we can loop back to them and circle back with them on a solution is to actually submit a feedback. Uh, the last tab on the dashboard at the very top allows folks to submit feedback directly to us. Uh, I, I get copied on every single one of those and between myself and the GIS folks that actually built the dashboard, we take a look at that, we kind of troubleshoot those issues and then we get back to folks with what the solution is that we've been able to find. And actually it's been a great way for us to find out about uh, problems that are in the dashboard to get those fixed quickly. And thank you, Susan. Yeah, I see that you're displaying that there. So there's the feedback form. It's a it's a real quick form to fill out. Uh, you can leave your email address if you wish, if you want to be recontacted, or you can leave that blank as well. Right. This is a drop down from this little thing right here. Thank you, Paul and Lieutenant Jacobs. That was great. Um, the other thing uh, that was commented on was uh, I. The comment was I silence my phone at night. I put it on standby. So the trick there is when you sign up for code red, notice the two uh, 800 numbers that code red uses. You need to enter both of those into your, into your phone book and title them code red so that when you get this 800 number, you know it's not a prank call and it'll say code red. And then include those two numbers in your friends and families uh, section on your phone because your friends and family will ring through uh, when you put your phone on silent at night. Um, and um, then lastly, there was a comment, you know, what happens? Uh, is anybody doing anything about making sure that Comcast stays live, cell, to cell towers remain active? And that's kind of outside the purview of the coalition, but uh, yes, that is not being ignored. Um, okay, so now, the, oh, the one, one other thing to mention that the sheriff's office has provided 
tags to use when you leave your house. Uh, they're available at almost all the fire stations and they simply say evacuated. This is a way to make life easier for the law enforcement that is going around and making sure that communities have been evacuated. You hang that on your address sign so that when a deputy or a fire uh, personnel come through the neighborhood to make sure it's evacuated, they know you've gone. And uh, it, uh, if you have a 100 or 200 foot driveway, it just obviously makes it that much easier for law enforcement to ensure that the neighborhood is safe. So if you don't have one of the evacuation tags, go to uh, the near, either the sheriff's office or uh, a fire station and they will, they will have that for you. So while we all hope that we never have to evacuate, uh, that time may come. We want you to leave as Lieutenant Jacobs and Paul Cummings told you immediately, as soon as you get that first phone call, we want you to leave. And if that's the case, your dress can be relatively casual. But if for some reason you didn't get the message or you chose to get Aunt Bessie's meat platter off the wall before you leave, uh, we have Chris Riley to tell you what the appropriate dress is when you leave your house. So Chris, you're up next. I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen here and uh, start off with this. So, um, um, basically a uh, common sense approach is what this is regarding. It's, it's, if you were to step outside in the winter, how would you dress for the winter? You'd wear a coat, jacket, boots, that, all that. Similar thing with fire. Um, you see constantly people on the uh, news that are interviewed in wildfire areas. And I like to pick on Southern California because it's always a guy in a garden hose with sandals and a t-shirt and shorts on that's going to defend his home. And meanwhile, the fire is approaching rapidly through the chaparral. Um, so I came up with this to try to share with um, people that are not fire service personnel. And that's, that's my background. I um, have a long career and I'm retired now. Um, personal protective clothing equipment. I'm going to go through this and it may be a little bit fast, but it is available on the website under educational resources. Uh, this is, I have an updated version here, which I'll put in uh, that uh, Jeff Peach can, can load up and uh, you can access that later to go over something. If I have enough time this evening and people have questions, we can go back to one of the pages, but I'm going to go through it a little bit quick. So just bear with that. Um, all right. In, uh, Wildfire evacuation, there, there's obviously multiple threats. So this, this picture here I chose because it's an excellent shot of vehicles driving through an ember stream and, and a fire that's obviously moving through the area as they're evacuating or as they're trying to go from one point to another. And their, their safety is obviously at, at risk here. Um, the, the thing that we think about with vehicles, and I know um, one of our other uh, presenters this evening is gonna get into this probably, um, but vehicles run on oxygen, just like people do. If you get into an environment that's less than 16% oxygen, that vehicle may quit working. Um, our, our fuel injected vehicles seem to do better now than the old carbureted versions, that, that, um, but be, be aware of that. If you see heavy, dense smoke and you drive into that area, it's possible your, your vehicle could stall. So just keep that in mind. But the main thing is that your ability to, to stay calm, to uh, think clearly, be, be able to react appropriately when you, when you can't, and this is your physiological response, when you can't breathe, see clearly, you're getting embers in your eyes, you, you're, you're looking for temporary safety refuge, and if you have to leave your vehicle or your residence, and the fire's moving rapidly through the area you're in, um, the idea is that you're prepared for that. Um, so, during evacuation, you can encounter these conditions and threats are dangerous to life and health. There are multiple threats, and that's that's a list there. And, and you, you, if, you're, if you're prepared to face that hostile, life-threatening environment during exposure to high ambient temps, over 100, 100 degrees, plus the heat of the fire, um, which is convected heat. There, now, direct flame contact, you're in serious trouble if that's happening with you. But generally, it's heavy smoke, hot objects, searing hot air that yeah. you're breathing now. Um, you, you can create difficulty breathing, you have embers of firebrands, ash, dust, flying debris, um, um, and, and among other things. Um, okay, so just in, in talking about these items, these are things that you need to think about that you can encounter uh, personally. All right. Yeah, it's going to roll a little fast. 
All right, the uh, personal protective clothing and equipment. We, we've gone through this with COVID, what everybody thinks of as personal protective uh, gear, such as face masks and gloves and wash your hands. This is different. It's, it's, it's about what we can wear, the attire. And basically you could go from, from top to bottom, from head to toe is how I approach it um, to talk about these things. Headwear. Have a hat, and I show a leather hat in the middle because leather is what it's it's pretty much flame resistant. It, it'll it'll last. It's also usually a little stiffer. It won't it won't crush down in a breeze. I'm showing other hats or examples of them that have um, neck um, protection, which is made for sun, right? And some of these hats are probably synthetic, which you don't want. You you you're much better off with other materials, and we'll go into that in a minute. Um, the reason for neck protection is that embers are going to get in your collar. If you, if you turn your back to the fire and you're in an ember stream where you're getting a lot of them blowing in and they, they'll burn you, they'll, get, they'll start burning your clothing, little holes in your clothing, you'll, you'll, get, you'll be very irritated by it because it hurts when, it, when the ember lands inside your, your uh, neck and gets down your collar. So have some way of protecting your, your, your head and neck. And, and the other thing is a wide brim hat allows you maybe a better ability to, uh, to, to stave off some heat if you have to put your head down towards a radiant heat source. Um, as firefighters, we wear helmets, and that's what they do. Face shields, helmets, goggles, things like that really protect you your from, from radiant heat. Sure. Okay, so obviously the best protection is going to be a helmet of some type. If you have a construction helmet, or you can buy these online, but not everybody needs to have one. A hat will do fine if it's the right kind. Um, and, and the goggles, the reason, the reason I show goggles is like it, it, something that's, if it's padded and enclosed, smoke's not going to get in your eyes. And, and not being able to see is, is not good. If you have to leave your vehicle, you're leaving your house and you're in that environment that's coming down upon you, being able to see is an important thing. The other is respiratory protection. And we all know everybody probably has some kind of mask now, whether it's an N95 mask or other type, or the one you see the, the wildlife firefighters wearing, the uh, like the Respro or the, the Bandit. There's other, there's other ones out there um, that do a very good job of car the filtering carbons. So you, you might not be as likely to get a headache later if you're exposed to a high carbon environment like carbon monoxide. In the photo, this, this photo is from Australia. It was last year during their brush fires. And this is kind of an example. They're wearing masks to protect their breathing, but you'll see how they're dressed, this mother and her child. And if you look at the sky, it's orange. They're in trouble. <laughs> you see an orange sky. That, that, that fire is pretty close to be creating that type of environment where the sun's blocked out and, you're, and you've got this filtered light coming through. Um, but they should, the, the, the child's in a tank top and she's wearing like some kind of a t-shirt or tank top type also. So they're obviously just having to leave quickly and didn't think about what to wear. So then they're outdoors right now where they're probably going to their vehicle or somewhere else. But that's, that's an interesting photo because it, it shows both uh, conditions, the respiratory protection and the way they're dressed. Um, trying to get this thing to roll. Okay, the other, going, going down, your know, hands, your body protection, any pair of gloves will do that's leather being the best. Um, the wrist cover, because you, you, want, you want some protection if your sleeves are, are uh, open up or, or short, you don't have time to button them or something. Um, those are North Star, the Wildland gloves, those are the best, but you know, it's like having five thumbs. The dexterity is not real good. So if you're, if you're getting in your car and you've got gloves on, you're gonna have to take them off to, to take care of um, the ergonomics in your vehicle and, and, and driving. Um, and as we go down, the other thing, some upper body protection, long sleeve shirt. I show a Nomex shirt in the center there. It's a Cal OSHA um, required one for uh, firefighters. It's a type. Um, they're single layer. Uh, Nomex will, it can kind of potato chips when it gets hot and burns, but it doesn't continue to burn, it self extinguishes. Heavy cotton's good, it will burn, but it's, it's comfortable if you're in that. And the other thing is wear two layers. Have a t-shirt on or undergarment and, and try to layer up because it's the air layers between the garments that keep the heat off your skin. Um, and yeah, you're probably going to sweat, but once you get in your vehicle, you have the chance to turn on the air conditioner or you're waiting in your home, you can certainly AC. Um, leather's very good, um, uh, but it's heavy and it's hot. So the amount of time your exposure in a hot environment, you have to kind of think of what your own health requirements are for your ability to withstand uh, heat. And you don't want to be, you don't want to suffer heat exhaustion at the same time you're trying to uh, evacuate. Um, the uh, wool is inherently flame resistant. And, and I, I put seven and a half ounce surge wool. That's what firefighters uniform pants were made of at one time. And they wear them in San Francisco and Oakland and other places. Um, and used to go into structure fires like that. Uh, they put on a turnout jacket and, and wear the wool pants. Um, 
Uh, Nomex Kevlar, PBI, the flame resistant materials, that's what firefighters wear or have, you know, pilots, um, air, air crew in, in, uh, in the military um, and on. They're, they're, uh, it works, it's, it's, some, it's somewhat hot to wear, but it's, and it's an available online. Yeah, you can buy these things. You can get Nomex uh, online if you go to just Wildfire Fire Supply, you could buy an outfit. But that's that's a little extreme, maybe. Um, the other the other said uh, um, to to just get avoid the synthetics. Okay, no polyester or other lower body pants, long long legged pants. Obviously, um, they got to show just you know even jeans uh, are made of cotton. They're they're uh, pretty comfortable. Everybody likes wearing jeans, but but that's better than nothing on your legs. And the other you have no mechs again. The other but. Uh, and then, and then the three, uh, the different materials, their types that, that are they're protective, their degree of protection. All right, back down to boots, footwear, something sturdy, no sandals. Okay, um, that's uh, some with closed toes. Toes, you know, that we're showing. There's obviously forestry boots or riding boots, or you can wear hiking boots. Um, but if you're stuck, you just something. Uh, your 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 tennis shoes, probably some rubber soles. If you have to get out and the pavement's hot or the ground you have to cross is hot, um, and and like we always say as firefighters, your your safest place when you're when you're in a burn area, or you're in a wildfire is is in the black, meaning what's already burned. You want to move towards what's already burned and stay out of the green area because that's where you're going to get caught. So if you don't have footwear that allows you to do that, you're probably going to get burned feet, especially if you step in a hot hole that's just full of uh, coals or ash at, at that point. Okay. The other thing I included here was just safety, visibility, alerting, warning devices, a whistle to, to, to alert somebody to your location. If it's if it's smoky or dark, it's night, a flashlight so you can see any towards most of these things, the whistle, four dollars, you know, Walmart. The uh, the other one's got a compass on it, which I don't in smoke you can get disoriented and lost in which ways most of us have our phones that have GPS on them or compass. Um, an air horn, even a small air horn, twenty, you know, what is that? Twelve dollars. Um, and I, I like the uh, the safety strobe. That's a, that's a good item which can clip on to something. All these have a lanyard or some way to clip them. Um, the other's the more the green lighted one is a more sophisticated um, guardian angel. That you can that they, they sell that for public safety people. I don't know how much it's being used or where exactly, but but I, I found it online and it's it's not really it's probably ninety nine dollars somewhere around there. Um, but it clips onto the, your your jacket or your shirt, and uh, it has different alerting capabilities as well as the flashlight possibility. A lot of us think our phones are going to do our flashlight for us. That's that's not that's not the best thing to be using for uh, nighttime visibility or to be seen. That's another thing with a, with a hand light. You can you can see and you can be seen. Um, on on the uh, coalition website, if you go to the link in education resource, there'd be time to. I, I'd advise to watch this video again. It's this was taken in Australia last year, and uh, most of their firefighters are volunteer in, in their bush areas in their wildland areas, which is which is pretty amazing. Consider the amount of fire they have to deal with. Um, my, the, this is a crew that's in their engine, and they are proceeding through a fire area, much like the Ember Stream in the first picture you saw. And they, they're deploying a fire blanket to, to, while, while they're while driving along. The, the, the driver's on the right in their vehicle, obviously, because it's, it's Australia. But they, they're, and they're, they're very calm about it. They're talking about what they need to do. And they're, what they're protecting themselves from is radiant heat. Now, if, if you're out in an area, and let's say evacuation, the roads get backed up, and here comes the fire, and you, you're, you're pretty safe in your vehicle, except for radiant heat. The fire will blow through the area. It's not going to explode your car. It's not going to catch it on fire right away. You have, you have lots of time and you have air to breathe. You shut your vents off, you turn off the recirculation, and you get below the windows. You get down in the car. Um, and if, if you can't, then you need to cover yourself with something to, to and that's where your wool blanket comes in, you know, your, your, your surplus wool blanket. Just something to stop the radiant heat from, from getting your skin. Um, if you're outside the vehicle, you have to find a barrier or object, something that you can get behind your car. And that's where um, I think in my last photo here, this is if uh, <laughs> if Chief Mathias was here, he'd say, my guys would never be in that position. I've been in that position. I've been down in San Bernardino. I got burned over like that, where we, we never even got back into the vehicle. We had to, we had to, and they're using what they're using that vehicle to shield themselves from convected and radiant heat. And that is pretty much the end of uh, my presentation there. Okay. Uh, lastly, we have Chief Gamelgard with us. 
from the city of Grass Valley Police Department. And uh, he's gonna tell us a little bit about safe driving uh, once we are dressed appropriately, as Chris told us, and we're on the road and we're leaving town. So Chief Gamelgard, uh, the podium is yours. So Bob, thanks for having me. I will be relatively brief because I know we're pushing up against the end of the agenda, but also my topic is relatively brief. It's on um, safe driving during evacuation, particularly we're focusing this time of year on fire evacuation and uh, just reiterate a couple of things. First, know your zone, go to that Nevada County, mynevadacounty.org or .com. Both of them will get you there. Dashboard, make sure you know your zone. Also make sure you're signed up for code red because that's the first thing you need to know is about when you need to get on the road. Um, and then besides that, the other thing just to mention is always be monitoring your, the weather, your property, the fire conditions, and you can never leave too early. The earlier you leave, the more likely you are to have a success, successful evacuation. Um, you can always come back if the conditions allow later um, and you never needed to evacuate. But if you're the first one on the road, I saw a post the other day, it said, uh, remember you're not stuck in traffic, you are the traffic. So um, try to avoid that. Um, so back to, back to the, the order of operations, leave immediately, be ready to leave early, have your stuff ready so you aren't spending time doing that. Uh, if you do not have battery backup or generator backup and we have a red flag warning, make sure your garage, you know how to open your garage door and or have it open and have your vehicle outside. Have it easy to leave because in smoke conditions, you may not want to be backing up. So it's all about preparation. If you can drive one car and make sure it's the most dependable, uh, it's important that your vehicle is reliable because you don't want to be the person that slows everybody else down as much as you want to be the person that can get out safely. Avoid big uh, accessory vehicles like RVs, fifth wheels, trailers, stock trailers, things that um, make it difficult to navigate our relatively narrow county roads in our, in our region. Um, and then Remember too, if it's daytime and uh, and you remember, turn on your headlamps because in smoky conditions, you want others to be able to see you. Watch out for emergency vehicles, yield the right of way to them when possible. And then this goes back to your preparedness. Um, the comment here is tell someone where you're going and when you have arrived, even one step further, have a plan with your family members and friends so they know that if you're evacuated, where your point A is gonna be, where your point C is, B is gonna be and point C is gonna be so they can check on you because you cannot rely on communications to be up and functional. So it's better that people know, hey, if Alex is evacuating, I'm gonna end up at my brother's house. If my brother's house is always an, under evacuation. I'm gonna be at my mom's house. And if I'm not there, then I'm gonna be at my third location. So make sure that people know that so they know how to check in with you. Because if there is a fast moving fire, um, your law enforcement agencies are gonna be attempting to account for you. And the faster we can do that, the more comfortable we're gonna feel and your loved ones are gonna feel to know that you're safe. Um, I think that touches all the points. So that's what I have for you tonight, Bob. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Gamelgard. I appreciate it. As Chief Gamelgard said, you can't leave too early. Uh, when you get the, just leave, just get in the car and leave. But bad things happen to nice people. And when that happens, there are certain things you need to be mindful of. And uh, our, our assistant fire, uh, fire marshal, Patrick Mason, will tell us exactly what we need to know. So Patrick, you're up. All right. So uh, basically, uh, if you're evacuating, you get an obstruction on the roadway, a tree down, telephone lines, telephone pole. Um, can it be moved in a timely manner? Do you have the resources available? Or do you have a secondary uh, evacuation route? Uh, don't burn your precious minutes and your precious seconds trying to lop up a tree that's 36 inches round. Um, you're not going to get there in time. If the obstruction can't be moved and you don't have a secondary evacuation route, the best thing you can do is return back to your house. Turn back to your house, call 911, let the dispatcher know that you're there, uh, give them the location. That information is going to be passed on to us in law enforcement. Um, as soon as you get there, while you're calling 911, fill the sinks, fill the bathtubs, anything that's going to hold water, start filling it up. Um, remove all flammable materials away from the outside of your house. Hopefully that's already done. Um, but I'm talking patio furniture, the cushions on it, doormats, brooms, flammable wall decorations. We've all seen it go up. 
um, those little fuzzy doormats right at your front door. Um, pull furniture away from the windows when you're inside the house. That radiant heat that Chris was talking about, it'll set the couch on fire just inside the slider door. So pull that uh, furniture away real quick. Take down any material, drapes, um, curtains, anything like that. Um, and then turn off the, H the HVAC system. Uh, patrol the house. And then if you're going to cover your mouth, do it with a dry cloth. Don't use wet. That radiant heat can turn that wet cloth into steam, which will then give you steam burns. So uh, once the fire front passes it's safe, and it's safe to do so, take a lap around the outside of your house, take a jug of water with you, put out your hot spots. Um, Chris touched on inside a vehicle, we're in the wool, staying low. The biggest thing here is don't panic. The house is, the house is going to take a lot longer to burn down than it is for that fire front to go by. Um, the conditions outside are a thousand times worse than what you're experiencing inside. So it might get smoky, it might get hot, but at the same time, don't step out that front door because it's a lot worse if you go out there. There you go. Okay. So again, the message is you can never leave too early, but if that bad thing happens and the tree does fall across the driveway, it, you, it, you still can be safe. And now we, now we know what it is. So Scott, we're done. Thanks for moderating, Bob, and, and thanks to, to all of our speakers. That was just a ton of useful information that, uh, you know, 120, 150 people here on this call will hopefully take away. So uh, I, I think just two quick points to wrap up. The, the first is the messaging in the previous meeting. Um, questions were asked repeatedly about um, should we wait to be told where to evacuate? The response was no, evacuate. Um, you know, questions about should we wait until um, we hear multiple sources? No, evacuate. Should we, uh, if we get the word from any of these systems we heard about, should we call 911? No, take the word and evacuate. So we're starting from the premise that evacuation early is your safest play. And then the second thing that I want to put out to the group is, is just a challenge because, you know, certainly of the, the many, many points that were put out here today by by all of the experts on this call from, you know, chief of GVPD to, um, you know, the various fire organizations um, and the experts in our community, you know, you've probably heard a lot of this before. So instead of, you know, saying to yourself, you know, I, I've heard this before, my, my challenge for all of you is really to think about what are you doing about it and how are you implementing this in your own home? And then can you pull in two other people to that story? Can you, can you find a nugget in today's meeting and share it with a neighbor, share it with a friend, post it on Facebook, get the word out to your community? Because I am not concerned about any of you on this call today, um, but we got about 100,000 people in this community. So 150 on this call today is a great start but please help us and get that word out there. Um, with that, um, you know, one of the ways you can get that word out is coming to the next meeting and bringing someone with you. So um, our next meeting is set for August 6th. So next month, uh, again, Survivor Stories is our focus. So this was our experts this month. And if you wanna hear what that's really like on the ground and to go through those situations and hear what it's like when those uh, flames are burning over your house and you gotta get out, um, we're going to have some people who have lived through that to share their experience and their lessons. So thank you all for your time. We will catch you next month.